the best Maui Invitational field I have ever seen lived up to the hype, and most importantly, it left me walking away with a brand new number one team in the nation. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host today, Isaac Shade, and I want to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there. Yes, coming at you on Thanksgiving. I want to welcome you everydayers and say thanks for making us your first listener watch every single day. Come join our Discord where we're having great conversation about college basketball all the time, even today, Thanksgiving. The link to that is in the show notes. By the way, a note on Friday's episode. Um, we're not going to do any recording on Thanksgiving Day today. So what we're going to do is Andy and I are going to record together on Friday after the battle for Atlantis is complete. And we're going to give you some takeaways from Feast Week. And then we'll publish that immediately after we're done recording. So stay tuned for that. Coming up on today's show, I want to talk about Battle for Atlantis's first day, getting that kicked off run you around some other stuff that happened in the nation and also get you prepped for actually a pretty good slate of college basketball today on Thanksgiving. So forget all that football and the Macy's parade, watch some college basketball. And I also want to say some words of thanks to all of you out there. We do this because we love college basketball and we just love getting to talk about it. But we do this because of you. Like this is all about coming together to talk about something we all love. And Andy and I um, just consider it a pure joy to get to share our love and knowledge and insights on college basketball with you. So hopefully um, it is meaningful and helpful to you um, in fun ways and informational ways and as an escape from life sort of way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of both me and Andy. All right, let's start with Maui because good grief. This field, as we know, was absolutely loaded. And a lot of times that doesn't live up to the billing, but goodness, this tournament did, obviously, particularly at the top end. Um, let's start with the championship game, which was Purdue and Marquette. Boilermakers win an exciting, exciting finish to the game, 78 75. Uh, it didn't always look like it would come down to it, but man, this Marquette team is so scrappy that they were able to keep working, keep plugging away, even with Oso Iguodaro having some first half foul trouble. They just made life miserable for Purdue and in particular Zach Eady and probably fouled him a lot of times that weren't called. That happened. We talked about it uh, a couple days ago, but that happens to Zach Eady all the time. And uh, they just got to find ways to um, call fouls in his favor more often. So this championship game though to me was befitting of a tournament that had the the type of talent and teams that were in this tournament and you just love to see that you don't you know you don't want it to be like a 20 point margin of victory in a championship game uh biggest takeaway from this game is i've said it before and i'll say it again zach Eady is huge but specifically right now i want to say it because his height and just bigness allowed him to make a couple important plays down the stretch to help Purdue pull this thing out. And I do mean pull it out. Um, Marquette was down one point in, I can't remember how much time's left on the clock, under 30 seconds. Um, Marquette almost forced a shot clock violation. I think it was Braden Smith that just barely got off a three. It missed. So Marquette's going to be able to get possession down just one, hold for the final shot. I mean, what more could you ask for, right? Nope. Here comes Zach Eady to just tip it in, and they go up three, and that's your ball game. Um, and then there, there was um, another play that he made as Marquette went back down, uh, just doing things to get this victory. What was it? Um, anyway, I, I can't remember. And then um, Purdue just hangs on, and there you go. That is the game. But seriously, Marquette, what a push, what a run from them. Uh, they cut it to three. Uh, with an 8-0 run around 10 minutes left, and Purdue pushed back out, but then Marquette just pushed again. Um, they got it down to three with a minute 45, and then we just had that whole closing sequence. Um, what I loved that Marquette was able to do, despite, yes, probably some fouls, <laughs> um, was just made it so difficult for 
Purdue to get the ball into Zach Eady. I mean, it, it, it just neither lawyer nor Smith or anybody had an easy time of that. And it's just because of this shock of smart havoc system that they run. Um, and so th- that's incredible. Now, here's what I will say. Purdue shot the ball a lot better in this game. I, I think there was a game earlier in the week where they didn't. And I was kind of like, ah, I just don't know with Purdue and that, like, what are, what are we doing? But just, sh- they and they just have to be able to knock down open shots and they're going to get a ton of them because of the black hole that is Zach Eady. I think not. I think I see both Braden Smith and Mr. Lawyer to be infinitely improved, infinitely more confident, infinitely more mature and sure of themselves in what they're doing. And for these kinds of reasons, and because of what I saw from Purdue against other top teams in the land in this tournament, I am going to move Purdue to my number one team this week. They they had it, you know, like Zach Eady, he doesn't need to be better. He just needs to keep being Zach Eady. But what he needed, as we've talked about, is improvement from the guys around him, and that's what he got. And that's why I feel good about where Purdue's at right now. They're going to take some lumps because everyone does in a college basketball season. But I am on board with this team. By the way, also we could borrow. His like one handed little push shot set shot thing is is a thing of beauty. It doesn't look awesome, you know. It's just like, but it, it's fundamental and it goes in, and I love it. So, congrats to Purdue knocking this thing out, winning the loaded, loaded Maui Invitational Championship. Now, do not forget, we had an epic uh, matchup and battle in the third place game between Tennessee and. Kansas Jayhawks win this one with a wider margin of victory than I expected for whoever was it was that won this game, 69 to 60. Um, and honestly, the the takeaway here is that it was huge for Kansas to rebound from Tuesday's loss to Marquette, especially in the way they did in that kind of um, physical environment and go against another physical team in Tennessee and take care of business. Keeping in mind that Tennessee beat Kansas last year and held the Jayhawks to just 50 points. Really, really important, I think, for their psyche and their confidence in themselves um, to win and win in this way. With Kansas, though, here is some hesitation still from me. And Leaf Tulin has talked about this a lot. They just don't have enough shooting right now. They have guys that can do it. They're just not getting it. They were 4 of 12 from this game, which is a fine percentage, 33%. But the volume is not there. And I know Kansas is a team and, and plays this way in their bill self where they're not going to live by the three as much. And in fact, they shot a great percentage overall in this game. But they also struggled at the free throw line, just 11 for 22. Uh, They need to be able to be better there. One of the things that was interesting to me is that Tennessee was not able to keep Hunter Dickinson in check in the same way that Marquette had done the night uh, before. Um, Dickinson had 17 points, 20 boards, two assists, a steal, and a block. And um, that is what he has to do for Kansas, particularly when they're not shooting well. But here's the thing. If Kansas is not shooting very well, what are opponents going to do? They're going to start sagging down. This is going to, my microphone is going to be Hunter Dickinson for those who are watching. They're going to sag down off the shooters, dare them to make it and just surround Hunter Dickinson and make him go to work. So we'll see what happens there. Santiago Vescovi leads the way for Tennessee, 21 points. Here's my takeaway with Tennessee. They leave uh, Honolulu, they leave Hawaii one and two in the tournament and four and two overall. But honestly, how far can you actually drop Tennessee? You can't really drop them. Why? Because these two losses are to the number one and number two teams in the nation, Kansas and Purdue. I, I just can't punish a team too much for losing to a team they're supposed to lose to and playing them very competitively. Like they just played the right now, the teams that are considered the top two teams in the land, other elite teams played them well, sure lost by a combined 13 points. It was by four points um, and then nine points. Um, But like, I'm not going to drop Tennessee very far, if at all in my rankings. I hope you see that logic and can get on board with it. And the other two closeout games of Maui, uh, Syracuse and Chaminade is in progress right now. It's an absolute blitzing. I uh, forget the actual, actual score, but it was 52 to 18 at the half. So that's all you need to know. 
And then, listen, I got to go to bed. I'd love to stay up for Gonzaga and UCLA. I'm going to get up on Thanksgiving morning as you're listening to or watching this uh, and watch back that game because it's going to be epic. Both of these teams, I think, are teams that are going to be infinitely better in February and March than they are right now. They've got the pieces, just got to put it together. And I love that we've gotten, like, this is the fourth time they've played in four seasons. We're getting consistent um, matchups between Gonzaga and UCLA, and I love it. So um, anyway, that game will be going on. I'm already going to be dreaming of Turkey and the Macy's Parade and everything else that Thanksgiving Day brings with it. Well, from one tropical location to another, Battle for Atlantis kicked off on Wednesday, and the evening session gave us some drama that the afternoon session could not even begin to touch. We'll talk about that in just a second. All right, let's get into the battle for Atlantis. As I just said a second ago, the nightcap two games were infinitely better, not necessarily in terms of play, because there was some very sloppy play, but in terms of close games that had excitement in that sort of way. Um, the, earlier in the evening, we had Memphis beating Michigan 71 to 67. And then the nightcap was Stanford and Arkansas going to double OT where Arkansas um, knocked off the Cardinal. And uh, that double O, I mean, those teams look exhausted. So congrats to Memphis and Michigan for getting to play them today because you got teams with tired legs. Let's start with Memphis and Michigan. Um, to me, this was the best on paper matchup of day one of battle for Atlantis. Kind of hated that they have to play, but part of it is because they both kind of come out of nowhere. Michigan does have one loss coming into this game. Memphis is was undefeated and still is by virtue of winning this game. Uh, the Tigers were actually led not by a starter, but by a young man off the bench by the name of Ashton Hardaway. Interesting surname there, playing for the Memphis Tigers. Got that? But seriously, homie dropped 17 points in just 18 minutes. That's phenomenal stuff. For Memphis, Javon Quinterly keeps doing what Javon Quinterly does. Nine points, eight assists. If he can continue to be this distributor for a veteran Memphis team, they're going to be in a good place. Overall, the Tigers had a nice balanced attack. Um, they, they were up 12 at, at halftime, got up by 16. Michigan cut it down to two eventually, but then Memphis held on for that four-point victory. So the, the final score is closer than this game actually felt, at least to me, um, and, and said it after FAU lost their first game and as Memphis has been playing so well, I think we got some real competition for the top of the AAC this year between Memphis and FAU. Really, really curious to see those. As for the second uh, game of the evening session, as I said, Arkansas does hold on to a double overtime victory over Stanford. Um, ah, I, I hate to have to say this because I know we've had this funny back and forth relationship Andy and I have with Arkansas fans this offseason because remember Arkansas beat Purdue in that exhibition game um, inside Bud Walton Arena, but then they've lost and frankly should have lost this game in regulation. Just Stanford couldn't do what they needed to do to win. Um, but I mean, good grief. It's a double overtime game where the winner only got to 75 points. I just met uh, Memphis. Arkansas right now is a great collection of talent, but that's what they are, a collection of talent. They are not yet a team. I believe that they will get there. Coach Musselman has a track record of figuring out. I think he will do that again, but we've got to, got to see it. Um, as for the game, uh, really interesting. And not just the first overtime saw hardly any points scored, just six combined points in the first four and a half minutes. Wasn't great. Nobody scoring. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. Um, Stanford got like a 39 ish foot buzzer beating, banked in three to send it to double OT. And then I, it's just, it's not, it wasn't a high level game. It was a close game, just not high level. And, and you just hate it for Stanford who needs these kind of wins. They led most of the second half. I mean, this was Arkansas was up 22 to 20 at halftime. That, that's what we're talking about here. So really need to see more from the hogs. Really curious to see what kind of legs they're going to have left as they play Memphis today on Thanksgiving day. Uh, as for the other two games, North Carolina and Northern Iowa tipped off the day. It was interesting. North Carolina trailed by six 
at halftime, but absolutely blitzed the second half and ended up beating Northern Iowa 91 to 69. So a complete turnaround in the second half. North Carolina has been struggling from the three point line uh, in their first three games, made seven, five and six three pointers. But in that second half blitz, they made eight in seven minutes and 45 seconds ish. So made more in just that little stretch than they had in any of their three entire games prior. Crazy stuff there. Um, North Carolina didn't need a ton of Armando Baycott today, which or on Wednesday, which I think is good for that team. He was the sixth leading scorer. However, he still had 10 points. And the leading scorer was Harrison Ingram, who had 16. So that, that balance is what I think that North Carolina team needs. Uh, second game of the day, Villanova absolutely slapped. Texas Tech, 85-69, and so uh, that just kind of, yeah, not much there. So anyway, Battle for Atlantis, getting going. Love to see these matchups. Going to have some more on Thursday. We'll talk about them more in just a little bit. Well, what we're going to do next is I want to run you around the nation, other stuff that went on on Wednesday, as well as getting you ready for Thursday's matchups, because we do, again, have some actually great basketball on Thanksgiving Day. So very excited to see that. And we'll talk about it in just a second. Okay, a couple other games from around the country on Wednesday. Fort Myers tip-off, Virginia just barely hung on to beat West Virginia. Did not see that coming. Um, man, with, with Virginia, there's just been some, I was feeling good about where they were at. There's been a couple signs this week that I don't know, man. I don't know that the offense is just not good for Virginia right now. Um, but they did get a couple late free throws, a nice offensive rebound for Ryan Dunn to salvage the win there over West Virginia. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see where both of these teams head. Tony Bennett's team and then interim coach Josh Eilert's West Virginia team that's kind of still just trying to figure out what they're going to be in, in the wake of everything with Coach Huggins this offseason. NIT season tip-off at Barclays Arena. The two semifinal games were last night, Wednesday. The uh, Constellation and Championship game will be tomorrow on Black Friday. In the earlier game, Baylor, 13th in the nation, took on an Oregon State team that, frankly, is just not very good. I'm sorry to all you Beavs fans out there. But Oregon State, for me right now, is the second worst power six team behind or ahead of only Notre Dame, who's just not really very good right now. Baylor wins this game 88-72, and frankly, it wasn't that close. Uh, Jacoby Walter, this freshman, folks, if you have not seen him, you have to get your eyes on a Baylor basketball game. 24 points, five rebounds, three assists, four steals, and zero turnovers. This is a freshman we're talking about. I mean, this is a guy that legitimately I have said might be bigger for Baylor this year than Keontae George was as a freshman last year. Again, hear this. This is a freshman, 24 points, five rebounds, three assists, four steals, zero turnovers. That, my friends, is a stat line right there. Another freshman, Eves Missy, if you haven't seen him in action, oh boy, he's moved into the starting lineup, 14 points, 14 rebounds, an assist, and two blocks. Yeah. So they've got some freshmen really helping bring around what some of the older guys are doing. Really, really curious to see what this Baylor team will be throughout this year. Uh, Florida and Pittsburgh was the nightcap. Uh, to me, two pretty evenly matched teams on paper coming in. As I record, it's in the final two minutes. Florida's up 78-68 with 1.59 to go. Uh, a little bit of a bummer for Florida. Uh, Micah Hanlogton, their, their big man that came in from Marshall this year, went down early with an ankle injury. I've been texting back and forth throughout the night with Brandon Olson, our host of Locked on Gators, who's actually there at Barclays. He's been keeping me up to date. And uh, Hanlogton was eventually ruled out. So we'll have to keep uh, an eye on that to see if he'll be ready to go for um, Friday's game or not. Hopefully so. Um, again, we'll keep our eyes out on that. Um, somebody else I want to let you know about is Princeton. I had screenshotted a um, little stat from Jared Burson, who is a great, um, does just a great job with college basketball stats, used to work for ESPN Stats and Info. He said this, Princeton this season, you ready? Neutral site win versus Rutgers, win at Hofstra, at Duquesne, at Monmouth, at Old Dominion. He says the Tigers are the first Division I team in the last 15 years to start 5-0, and with four of them being true road wins. Remember that Princeton team had a run, a nice run in the Sweet 16 last year, 
lost to, or uh, I believe to the Sweet 16, excuse me, lost some talent and is doing that to start the season. So make sure you're checking in on the Tigers and what they're doing. Um, had an unfortunate situation with Cal um, coming out of a, their game on Monday in the SoCal Challenge. There was a video that surfaced of um, Cal player Fardaz Amac, who's been at a couple different schools, uh, most recently at Texas Tech, confronting a fan after a game earlier this week, like went up into the stands. No, nothing violent, no no physical altercation, just words, but here's why. Fardaz is Afghan, comes by way of Vancouver, Canada, and allegedly during that game on Monday, a fan called him a terrorist and told him to leave the country. And so uh, Cal lost that game to UTEP by three, um, and that's the game that's in question. In fact, um, they, they were playing Tulane late on or played Tulane, excuse me, late on Wednesday night, and then they'll play San Diego State on Saturday, all in this SoCal Challenge. So from head coach Mark Matson, he said this, quote, throughout and after Monday's game, Fardaz Amak was allegedly subjected to abhorrent and offensive comments from a fan, including being called a terrorist. I have asked the SoCal Challenge Tournament director that a formal investigation be conducted and that this fan be barred from the premises. Fardaz and I had an important conversation today about how he needs to maintain his composure regardless of what takes place in a game or what is said to him directly. I am disturbed that Fardaz was allegedly on the receiving end of such language, and I'm disappointed that he confronted this fan in the stands. Fardaz understands my expectations for how he as a student athlete conducts himself. The consequences related to this situation will be managed internally, end quote. Oh, man. This is a tough situation because... Player, a player just simply cannot go up into the stands, and I get it. I would be incensed and infuriated. Um, but I mean, I remember live watching the malice in the palace with you know, just all that mess with the pistons, and it's just it can just lead to terrible things. And so, while it is um, as hard as it is, you just cannot do that, no matter how personal attacks are, you have to rely on security and coaches and others to do that for you. But at the same time, I, I, I understand why he did what he did. So it's tough. I can't condone the action of going into the stands for Fardaz. But there is absolutely no place in sports or anywhere else in the world for this kind of talk or, or this kind of slander against any human being. Uh, we just can't stand for it. And we must boldly and firmly condemn that kind of language. So... Uh, I hate this. I hope it will be resolved and um, that as Coach Madsen asked that that fan will be removed from the premises and uh, that they can figure that out. Okay, I told you I wanted to let you know there are some really actually strong games on Thanksgiving today. Um, the, the chief of which, you ready for this one? Arizona, third in the nation, and Michigan State, 21st in the nation, but was a preseason top five level team. So a great chance for Coach Izzo Spartans to really prove their medal against Arizona. I'm really, really curious to see this game. It is at 4 Eastern time on Fox. And as always, I love it when coaches just are, are able to get these games going. I mean, both Arizona and Michigan State have shown a willingness to do this. Uh, Michigan State's always done it under Tom, or excuse me, under Tom Izzo. And Arizona has already shown a willingness to do it in these first couple years under Tommy Lord. Remember, they scheduled a home and home with Duke. And so um, great stuff there. So forget football, man. Watch this game. No, I'm just kidding. I know you're going to watch some NFL, but there we go. Uh, other stuff around the nation on Thursday today. Battle for Atlantis continues on. Um, we've got Northern Iowa versus Texas Tech, North Carolina versus Villanova. That is the first time these two teams will have played since that epic national championship game. So really, really interested to see that one, and again, as we said earlier, we'll have Memphis versus Arkansas and Michigan um, against Stanford. And then the winner of UNC Villanova and the winner of Memphis, Arkansas will be the championship game on Friday. Um, ESPN Events Invitational gets going today on Thursday. We've got Iowa State versus VCU. Iowa State, man, they're off to a good start. Uh, Boise State versus Virginia Tech. Boise State. They're good. They're really good. Watch out for this game. Uh, FAU at Butler. We talked about FAU a little bit earlier with Memphis, so watch out for that one. And then Penn State, Texas A&M. 
Penn State uh, first year after um, Micah Shrewsbury heads off to go to Notre Dame where Mike Bray left. They've got some talent there, but um, Texas A&M, uh, you, if, if you are a, an everydayer, you know that we believe a lot in who Texas A&M is this year in a strong SEC. Watch out for Wade Taylor if you haven't seen A&M yet this year. Vegas showdown, we get NC State and Vanderbilt. I expect NC State to get that one, but we'll see. You know, Jerry Stackhouse is a former North Carolina Tar Heel and uh, has strong uh, feelings about NC State. So that, that could be interesting. And then we also get BYU Arizona State in that Vegas showdown as well. A couple sneaky games. Let me give you two of them. In the Hall of Fame Classic, which goes on in Kansas City, I've been up to that before. It's a fun event. The Hall of uh, the College Basketball Hall of Fame is right there at the T-Bone Bowl Center in Kansas City off to the side. If you've never been there, it's awesome. Go check it out. But Colorado State, undefeated and playing really, really good basketball. A high-level offensive team is playing Creighton, also undefeated, and also an incredibly high-level offensive basketball team, number eight in the nation. So that should actually be a really good basketball game. It's also at four, unfortunately, Eastern time, the same as um, Arizona and Michigan State. And then the other sneaky game I want to mention to you is Oklahoma and Iowa. That starts an hour earlier on FS1 at three. Oklahoma is undefeated playing better um, than I think a lot of people expected. They're highly ranked at Ken Palm. They're not ranked nationally yet, but they are uh, others receiving votes. And then Iowa uh, is playing pretty well this year. I think they've got one loss just so. Those are a couple sneaky ones for me. All right, folks, that's it for today. Again, happy Thanksgiving to you all out there. I hope you're having a great day, getting good time with your family, um, just taking moments to be thankful for things you have to be thankful for in life. And let me say one more time again, on behalf of Andy and I, how thankful we are for all of you. This is the joy of my day every day, getting to sit down and talk college basketball. The greatest thing out there, man. I know it's not perfect, but I just love college basketball so much. So thanks for hanging out with us. If you'd like to hang out with us in a different way, talk more college basketball, come join our Discord. The link is in the show notes. Seriously, we're hanging out talking college basketball basically all day long. Please make sure to subscribe to the show, smash the like button, and leave your comments on today's episode, what you thought about Maui and Battle for Atlantis, and what you're looking forward to in today's games. As always, apologies to the lawyer family, although today congratulations to the lawyer family for winning uh, the Maui Invitational. Go Wildcats, and until Friday, peace.